Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of V Radio. If this is your first time checking out V Radio, please be sure to check out my archives. I'm on many different mediums. You can watch me on YouTube, on Rumble, on BitChute. Uh, also, you can listen to a lot of my shows in podcast format on many different formats, including Apple Podcasts, etc. Um, you can find all that stuff at v-radio.us. If you would like to support my work um, through Patreon, Subscribestar, or PayPal, then that is also the place to do it, v-radio.us. I want to thank uh, everybody for tuning in today. Please like and subscribe and ring the bell. If you're on YouTube, do the equivalents on Twitch and the other places that I am today. I want to say hello to my YouTube people and to my Twitch people who are getting this live. For whatever reason, Facebook didn't like it, so it's not over there. Not that I get a lot of viewers on Facebook anyway. And um, today, <laughs> I am honored that my guest is Joanne, also known as Grambo by the internet. She was a fantastic witness during the course of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for coming on. Um, you know, it's interesting, I guess, you know, I, if I did have any bragging rights at all, it would just bit that I think it was like me in Kenosha County, I got this interview, but the mainstream media hasn't been able to get it yet. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm um, just not interested in sharing. I mean, it would be, I, I'm, I appreciate the time to talk about it, but I don't need mainstream media. It's just lies anyways. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And so I guess, first of all, let's get an, give you an opportunity to just kind of talk about, um, just to give people an idea to actually get to know you beyond the meme that is Grambo. Um, I guess in particular, can you think of a time frame in your life when perhaps you became more interested in politics than others, like maybe went from going from just kind of passively watching it to being more of an activist. I mean, I guess like, even if that was just when you finally decided to go to Kenosha, like, was there a moment in particular in your life that you think kind of stood out to make you pay more attention? Um, yeah, I wasn't really big in the, into politics until Obama got into office. Bush kind of got me going, but Obama pushed me a little further. And then uh, with Trump, I just, I just couldn't believe how every other day it was another fight with him. And then when all the rioting and um, protests started breaking out, then it, you know, you just get more involved and you're thrown in it. And um, <clears throat> I think it just kind of progressed since like the Obamas. Um, yeah, just the, the lies and his lack of, speaking out to his community. I mean, even during the riots in his administration, he said nothing to the black community. He had such a chance to help them out and he didn't do anything. Yeah, and so, I've heard that same point made by a lot of black activists actually. Continue. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that was kind of the start of it. And I think the summer of COVID when all the lockdowns were, um, I got laid off, you know, we couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't travel, you know, you're bound to your home. Um, but then all these protests are happening and that was all right. And the media was praising them and they're destroying things, but it was peaceful protests. That kind of uh, um, hit a kind of a nerve with me. I'm sorry, I've got a cold, so my throat's really sore. We'll forgive you. We'll <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I was just talking to some friends and, you know, just through chitter chatter on Facebook and just uh, messaging with friends. It's, everybody just saw us as somebody needs to do something. And, you know, this defund the police was just ridiculous because they've literally been defunded for years. Um, they've had so much money taken away from them. They're expected to, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're investigators. They're not supposed to be um, preventing crime. Uh, you know, they they investigate after things happen, basically. You know, I some percentage of the time, yeah, they do prevent the crime. But, you know, now they're dealing with domestic abuse and um, all these robberies, um, you know, the, the protests, the mental illness, you know, all the training that they need to deal with to just to understand what's happening, you know, in their in the public they're dealing with. All that money is always taken away from them. So 
lot of people don't realize that the police have been defunded for years. And if you don't believe me, go back and, and look at what the, um, they want to increase, you know, your city tax to give more to the police. Everything keeps getting voted down. So a lot of it um, has been defunded for a long time. So in the summer of 2020, um, it just got to a point where, yeah, somebody does need to do something. So me and a couple other uh, local friends thought that we'd start a little patriot group, just uh, Citizens for Patriotism, to support the police, the fire, EMS, hospital workers, because, you know, they were going above and beyond to help all the people with COVID. And we got together with our flags and just started a little patriot group. And uh, that's kind of where all it started with the activism. I wouldn't say I'm an activist, but that's just got how things kind of started. Okay. okay. Well, and I think that that's a... Good time, Good time actually to, to bring it up, it up would be, be that even during, during um, uh, getting a bit of an echo. From me? I don't know if it's from you or not, I'm assuming, but it's okay. It's not intolerable. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, <coughs> during the Obama years, I was at Occupy and he wasn't like kind to us either, which is one of the reasons why when everybody thought, oh, we'll vote Joe Biden, everything will be great. I was like, I don't think that's going to work out quite as well as you guys do, you know, and right. like, in fact, one of the pictures that I put um, actually on like that, that list of memes was an example, different examples where Obama had kind of crushed different protest movements over the course of the time that he was in charge. And I think that people, um, for me, um, what got me back on, though, had a lot to do with what was going on in Kenosha, because I just saw so many people lying about it. And yeah. You know, and that was left, right. It, it, there was just so much noise, and that's what made me put together my documentary. And mine, it was really rough because I'm not very good at video editing, um, and I was injured. And like the first version I made of it, I literally just recorded all of the narration in one sitting, and I had a um, broken tailbone at the time, so it was really uncomfortable. You know, um, mm -hmm. I've since fixed most of the sound problems with it, but it's it's obsolete because it you know it doesn't include new information that was garnered through the trial, but. I was just trying to account for Kyle's presence through the whole thing. And I managed to do that and it, you know, and it did change some, you know, change some minds, but, you know, overall, um, you know, there's a serious problem with the media right now. The media is like just out of control in the horrible ways that they're reporting on things. You know, like, I, I think that because of the fact that I don't watch the mainstream media, I didn't realize how bad it was until people start posting on um, Twitter and they're saying things like, wait, wait a minute, he didn't shoot any black people? Like, like yeah. they didn't know. <laughs> was There's like, still out there today that, that believe that he shot black people. I was just in a conversation not that long ago with somebody who was saying stuff like that. It's like, you know, oh, he killed all three of the black guys. Like, um, there was no black guys that were shot. So right. they're, no, they're still I out agree. there. No, and, and so I guess... Um, Looking, I guess, let's go ahead and, and talk a bit, first of all, in what what motivated you to go ahead and go go to Kenosha? And like, did you, were you aware that there would be other people doing the same thing at the time? You know, or was it just kind of, I'm going to do my best as an individual to see what I can do to help? It was kind of a spur of the moment decision. Um, the night before we watched, you know, the of course, the media, um, what they were saying about it and what they were showing. We we're watching that. And then um, I did see that that 71 year old man got beat down trying to protect, I guess it, I thought it was his business, but I guess it was a friend of his. Um, he had seen the business burning on TV. So he went down there to put the fire out. And from him doing that with a fire extinguisher, he started getting beat down by the protesters. Right. Thank God there was one of them. I don't know. There's, there happen to be a lot of people that run along with the protesters to put out fires and, you know, to help, you know, maybe the medics, um, you know, other people that I don't really think are protesters or are with the BLM movement, but they think they're going along to help and assist and help prevent a lot of things. But thank God they helped the 71 year old man. I mean, he did have a broken jaw, but 71, I mean, you don't go beating up elderly people and there was no reason for that. Right. So right. that kind of pushed me. And then I was read, reading a post. I was checking up on the gentleman and I read a post and 
some woman was saying, we need help. We need people down here. I, I'm just one woman. I can't do it myself. And even I got goosebumps right now, just, you know, recounting that. And just all of a sudden I got a phone call and they said, hey, we're going to go down and we're going to help protect businesses. You want to come along? I'm like, hell yeah. Grabbed what I needed and they were leaving in five minutes. Grabbed my stuff, ran out the door and we headed down there. Huh. So when you arrived, what was the state of things? <laughs> well, on the way down there, we saw groups of vehicles, all different nationalities. I'm not picking out any damn group because there was whites, blacks, Asians, uh, Hispanics, all full in these vehicles, and they had their license plates blackened out. And I, you know, it was the first time I ever went to anything like this, so I never knew what to expect. <clears throat> but we saw that, and they were getting off the exits pretty early, and come to find out because they had the big bear cut, bear cats blocking blocking all the exits when you got down to Kenosha. So we had to go past those and then come back into town. <clears throat> but when we got into town, it was eerily quiet as you started to pull into town. And then you started seeing signs of businesses being boarded up. There was a church. In fact, you had it in one of your pictures in the beginning scenario of this. Um, the, the church sign Black said Black Lives Matter. And you look across the street, and all the businesses across the street were all boarded up. That church was pretty much boarded up. And then we started seeing businesses that were burnt down. And it was like, holy shit, this just... right. I just, I, like I said, I've never seen anything like that. It was very surreal. It was, I was shocked. And then we started seeing the crumbled buildings. I mean, brick buildings that were just in piles of rubble. And it was just continuous. And then we went past the car lot that was burnt down the night before. And you were just saw skeletal cars. It was like we just drove into a war zone. It was just shocking to see. And it was just weird. You're just so overtaken by looking at everything that um, I guess you don't really have time to think about anything else. You know, it's just you're just taking in everything that you see. So, it, like I said, it was like going into a war zone. It was very shocking to see for someone, you know, your first time, I guess. I guess people do this all the time, go down there or, you know, the protesters. I just I don't know why they would want to go and do more of this once they see the aftermath. And, you know, so that's one of the things I think that really needed to be debunked was that they're still talking about this as supposedly a, um, a peaceful protest. And, like, peaceful protests don't burn down entire buildings. Right. You know? Right. And that's, and I would say that um, it really has to do with... Uh, the media's need to, for some reason, like shield, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement from um, any kind of scrutiny. And, you know, and it's and the problem with these like, amorphous groups is what I usually call them, is that there's a lot of different um, people individually who would say that they associate with the movement. And that's the new thing that they're trying to do now is they're trying to like say, well, then there's you know, the, there's national or there's the movement. You need to make it, you know, you need to, need to make a difference between the two or whatever. But it just turns into a game of, well, if anything good happens, well, that must have been Black Lives Matter. If anything negative happens, well, those people are not really in Black Lives Matter. Yeah, you know, those are the opportunists. Right. There's there's no way to like, you know, they, the, the, the reason why I keep coming back to why your organization needs to clean house and fix this stuff is if these sorts of things are happening in your name and you're not coming out to say that this isn't us, we don't support this, you know, then you, you know, you're on task for it. Right. When we, were, when we were in the Occupy movement, there were two violent organizations that were trying to push Occupy to be violent. One of them was black was BAM, which was by any means necessary, which is a reference to Malcolm X and you know violent activism that, that he flirted with at one time. And then Antifa <laughs> existed at that time as well, although they kind of called themselves the Black Bloc, but it's the same group of people, the same motivations. Yeah. And the and 
Occupy was still committed to peaceful protest in the Martin Luther King style. And um, they kept trying to influence people towards doing that, but we continually rejected it. And unfortunately, what it seems like now is that Black Lives Matter is essentially like the angry grandchild of BAM, you know, mm-hmm. and, and therefore inherited some of the energy of um, the Occupy movement, but it also ended up merging pretty heavily with the whole communist movement. And, you know, like, they, for the longest time, if you brought up, like, for us, like, people who were participating in left-leaning activism back in Occupy, when they started acting, for example, like, Antifa doesn't exist, we we're like, what? You know, or when they started acting like Antifa as an organization is not communist, we're like, no, that's not true. They just openly mm-hmm. told everybody that back then. You know, and the same thing with when people try to say that Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with communism. I'm just like, dude, the, the founders are communists. It's like, right. you know, and that's what's different is that, of course, we all believe that Black Lives Matter. Like they have these word games about their organization. So like, if you don't agree with everything that this group does, well, then that means you don't believe that Black Lives Matter. You know, yeah. and if you don't agree with what Antifa is doing, then that means, you know, if you're not anti-fascist, then you must be fascist. You know, like they create these um, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of, you know, um, labels for things. And, you know, it's not to say that the right has never done that. I mean, like the Patriot Act, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, support right. the Patriot Act or you're not a patriot, you yeah. know, and I, I just it, honestly... Um, the, the one of the things that bothers me the most right now is that polarization is preventing good conversations from taking place between reasonable people on the right and reasonable people on the left. And that's one of the reasons why I made that joke called the alt center or you know, like radical center, because it's to point to the fact that we are now in a situation where unless you're ridiculous, you're you're treated like you're the radical, you know, yeah. so like me, for example, <laughs> being left leaning but not being on board with wokeness makes me a radical somehow, you know, and the, and the right has their own hoops that they want you to pass through your, their, you know, their own purity tests as well, you know, and, you know, so basically um, I guess let's get back to just kind of understanding the scene in Kenosha, you know, like obviously widespread destruction and, and more importantly, the people that were getting hurt were not all, it wasn't all white, owned businesses like the the no. Mexican immigrant owned ice cream parlor was right. burned to the ground, you know, and obviously the car source, you know, was owned by, you know, um, Indian people, which is one of the reasons why people pass around the meme saying, you know, these guys showed up to protect these people's business, worst white supremacists ever, you know, yeah, because right. <laughs> because white supremacists are known for being highly supportive of immigrant owned businesses in the United States. Right. You yeah. Know. We didn't, we didn't even pick the business. It was, um, I, I didn't anyways, I don't know what the, we were following a car. So I don't know if they had a business picked or if they were going off that Kenosha guard. I'm not, not sure how we exactly wound up there, but there was a lot of businesses where you saw, um, gentleman standing with like a white hat with a red cross on. So I, I don't know if that was everybody's cue that this business needs help. Um, like I said, I was focused at looking at everything. I was, I was so in shock looking at that. Um, <clears throat> but that's, you know, we just happened upon that cor- that car source area owned by uh, those Indian gentlemen. But there were also black businesses that were burnt to the ground that um, the night, previous night as well. Right. And that's kind of the reason why I, I've been pointing out for a while and I actually put together um, a extensive video where I researched the actual science involved. And what I discovered was that Martin Luther King's perspective on when he would literally because they always say the riots are the language of the unheard part. And then they act as though that means he meant. So therefore, if you feel unheard, go burn down your community, which right. is what he said. <laughs> He said yeah, they, they take it to mean violence, and it doesn't. We're supposed to condemn riots as vigorously as we condemn the conditions that causes riots. Is basically the rest of the context. But what he was getting, and he also said, he said that they cause more problems than they solve. And what he's referencing is that, for one thing, riots and burning down businesses creates more poverty in your community. It doesn't yep. help you. 
you know, so it doesn't help you on that front. If you if they're going to complain that the reason that these riots happen, you know, is because of the, the poverty that they're in, then it makes zero sense to create more poverty by burning down your community. You know, and there, this isn't a matter of opinion. Like uh, Los Angeles still hasn't recovered from the, um, the L.A. riots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, one of the scientific studies that I found compared the recovery of Los Angeles to the recovery of Miami from a hurricane. And those are both places that are kind of rough places to live. But Miami recovered much faster. And the reason why is that people are going to be more likely to reinvest in your, you know, in the place that you live if the local citizens citizenry doesn't reserve the right to destroy their community anytime they don't like something the government is doing. You Correct. Know, well, look at all the people that that are moving out of California now. I mean, but even back right. then, because right. of all the violence, they, a lot of people were moving out then. I remember hearing that. Sure. And, you know, especially now because of the rioting and lo looting. Yeah, it's right. ridiculous. Right. The, and, go ahead. I was going to say the funny thing is that we heard um, that night that we stood, we heard a lot of people telling us, what do you care if we burn it down? That's what they have insurance for. It's like you don't understand um, domestic, it's, that's considered domestic terrorism. And, and that's another funny thing that I have to mention is they, they say they're not domestic terrorists, but it, the insurance considers that domestic terrorism coverage. Right. There's a, there's a special insurance coverage to handle rioting and looting. You know, they consider that under a domestic terrorist um, plan or however you want to state it. So we heard that a lot about what do you care because their insurance will just pay for it. They're rich. They can have that insurance. Like, that's not a true statement. The majority of the people, that's like people getting flood insurance when you don't live in a, in a flood zone. Well, in addition to that, it, it, okay, so then in, if that's the case, then why are they doing it? Like, what do they think they're accomplishing? Yeah. Like, what is it doing to change anybody's minds? Did anybody suddenly come around to saying, gee, you know, I really care more about police shootings because people showed up and burned down a bunch of buildings and then rich people yeah. got insurance payments. Like, you They're know, they're destructive I, to themselves. Well, right. And then when people leave those cities, then you end up like they'll try to label that racism. They'll say that's white flight or whatever, because after all, apparently, if you're you know a person who owns a small business, you should just be OK with them destroying your business anytime they take a mind to it. You know, mm -hmm. and if you're not OK with it, then that just means you're racist. You know, and if you won't right. invest in the community so that they once again reserve the right to destroy it again, then again, that just means that you're racist. It can't be that you don't feel like throwing your heart and money into a hole. You know, mm -hmm. and especially for these small business owners, you know, like that. I wish I remember the name of the family, but they got featured on one of the uh, media reports about the damage in Kenosha. But again, hardworking family, immigrants, Mexican family, you know, like the the, the matriarch of the family was still alive. The the man who actually formed the business. This is the ice cream parley, uh, parlor, you know, mm -hmm. um, had passed away. And like he had done everything that you're supposed to do to achieve the American dream. And it all went up in smoke. And yep. that, that's kind of where it comes back to, again, it's like, okay, so what are you trying to achieve? What is the effect that you think you're going to create by destroying a community? You know, and then there's the issue of like, we, but that brings us back to kind of like, you know, your situation, you know, being one of these people who said, you know what, I kind of had enough of this. Somebody needs to stand up and do something about it is that, one of the things that I keep noticing when we discuss Kyle Rittenhouse is that the chronology of events in the mind of the people, the majority of the people I talk to who are left leaning seems to begin with people showing up with guns to protect property. Like that's their beginning of the story as far as wrongdoing. They don't have any language for what was going on beforehand. When I yeah. debated uh, Kevin Glowicki, also known as Never Stop Voices, you know, he he is in that same mindset. And that's when I brought up the gentleman that you brought up who got knocked out and his, and his jaw broken. And he didn't yeah. even know who the guy was. He didn't remember it. And then I played the video for him. He was like, oh, I have seen that video. And I, I honestly don't know if he did. He's still focused on a group of armed people showed up and challenged us. And what is it that they were challenging? Well, that's why the first chapter of my documentary is literally named It All Started With a Dumpster Fire. 
Like, yes. That's what we need to fight about. If we just light dumpsters on fire and push them either at poli- at the gas station or at the police, that will do something to induce you know, police to be less likely to profile people of color and shoot them unnecessarily. Like, I don't see the connection. There's no strategy there, you know. And that was the other point I was going to say that science also proves that science also proves that it also hurts the support for your organization to engage in violent and um, destructive, you know, activities. You know, and it's not, again, not opinion. There's one study that shows peaceful protests are about 43% effective. Violent protests are about 26% effective. The difference also being that violent protests come along with the, the bad side effects of you've wrecked your local economy and you've ruined your reputation as an organization and you tend to actually cause more support for your opposition, whatever that is. Right. You know, so again not opinion, sociologically provable fact in the times before sociology was taken over by wokeness, you know? And so I guess, you know, you get there and, and the place is in a shambles and, you know, it, I get the impression that like, how many, how many would you, of those people would you say that you were with actually knew each other beforehand? Like, I'm sure a few did, but I didn't get the impression that they were all, it seemed like you guys just kind of got to know each other that night or am I wrong? No, you're right. Um, I knew three the three people I went down with. Um, so it'd be me and the two others, and that um, that Ryan guy that we went down with. I just had seen him like two other nights, but I didn't didn't know him. I think I heard his name once before um, until that night. So I just knew the two guys. They were in like our little patriot group that we had. Um, I just knew those two and we met everybody else down there. Right. I was kind of shocked and impressed at how many people I saw down there because there were um, people on roofs. There were people on their second store balconies and there were people that were sitting around apartment buildings that were all armed and they were protecting their, the homes, their neighborhoods, and the apartment buildings. So it was nice to see that. And then it was nice to see how many people had showed up at the car source. Uh, when we arrived there, I think we were the first ones. Um, and then, you know, Kyle and his friend Dominic showed up. And then we, there, um, after we took those pictures, there was a whole group of trucks and vans that showed up. And they came out and they all, you know, they pulled out their weapons too. And they were ready to help support businesses as well. So it was, it was good to see that. You know, that was something I just re-listened to your um, trial commentary. And you pointed out that Yellow Pants guy had weapons of his own. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he jumped on the car. Uh, they came walking in front of us. And the, the funny thing about that is, um, I believe they were the Boogaloo boys were leading the Black Lives Matter walk down the street. And when they walked in front of us, I guess they knew Ryan and they're all like, hey, yeah, friendlies, friendlies, friendlies. Right. Kind of looking at them like, I, okay, so are those the Boogaloo boys? Because I didn't know who they were. I'm, I'm not a big social media person, so I just didn't really know who they were. I'd only heard of them recently. Right. Um, But then things kind of got out of hand because they wanted to know why we were standing there, why we needed weapons. If we're just protecting something, why do we need weapons? Right. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I'm I'm listening to you. Go ahead. (laughs) Um, And then we had a burnt out vehicle that was sitting on the front of the lot where I was on the ground and then Kyle was next to me. And I think uh, Ryan was next to him. And then there was a car and it was burnt out from the night before. And yellow pants jumped up on top of that car and and he was facing the street and he was screaming black lives matter screw you know well f these people screw you and then he jumped around as he jumped around to face us he put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a gun and he had it to the side and that's when everybody drew kind of drew their guns on him and then the crowd went mad you're drew you're 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 drawing your guns on us. You're drawing your guns on us. 
And when he did that and the crowd got mad, that's when I saw Rosenbaum come out from between the people. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Yellow Pants, he pulled a gun out of his pants. And there was another man, and you could actually, you seen the video, um, which I hadn't seen it in a while. I saw it in the beginning, but then I went off Facebook for quite a while, social media. Um, but I just, I can't remember who posted it. I just saw it in like another podcast or something. But he walked up and he was standing like right next to, and I call him uh, Grimace, I call him. Him and his wife with the red hair. What's his name? Joseph, is it? Joshua Zeminski. Zeminski, that's it. Sorry. Right, right. He came walking up next to Zeminski and you heard him um, rack his gun. Right. So, yeah, he came running up. As soon as Yellow Pants jumped on the car, he came running up and he racked his gun. So Is this the guy with the, did he have like a blue shirt on and like? He had a pistol, or am I thinking of someone else? Yeah, no, you're right. He had the pistol, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, it was the one with the blue shirt on. <laughs> so that means he racked his gun multiple times to... Oh, okay. yeah. That's the guy yeah, so... I call Ice Cube because it's like he was pretending he was hard. He's like, let me just <laughs> yeah, put one in the chamber. And the fact that he went and did that at a different time in the evening just shows that he was doing it to posture. That That's hilarious. Yes. I'm sorry, continue. That just observation from watching too much video. No, and, you know, I did see other video where he did the same thing. So I think we we're talking about the same gentleman, yes. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Yellow Pants, he pulled the gun out, and he had it down by his side. I saw him. I mean, I had my hand on my gun the whole time, but I was facing the girls that were in front of me. You know, they were trying to call me out, and I'm watching Yellow Pants, and then I noticed Rosenbaum, and then I looked back at the girls, and then I noticed Rosenbaum, and as soon as Yellow Pants jumped around and started screaming and everybody had pointed their guns at him and told him to get off the vehicle, then the crowd started going nuts. So I'm like scanning back and forth, you know, you got to watch everything here. And I remember looking back at the girls, and then I looked back at Rosenbaum, his arm was up and it was coming back down. And then and that's when, like, he must have, I don't, I don't know if it was him. I had to make the assumption but that's when I heard chemical bomb and your eyes just started watering, your nose started running. Uh, it just was nuts at that point. As soon as yellow pants jumped on the vehicle, that's when all hell broke loose with the crowd against us. See, that's interesting because everybody just refers to him as if he was like some kind of victim of being threatened or whatever, but no, you know, but everything was, everything was peaceful. Everything was peaceful in front of us. You know, the girls, they were they were talking to me. They were doing the Black Lives Matter, right? And I'm just scanning, you know, I'm just looking. And everything was peaceful until Yellow mm -hmm. Pants jumped up on the vehicle and he incited that whole, um, I don't want to say riot in front of us, but he incited the whole incident that happened in front of us. That's interesting. You know, that's, <laughs> and so that would have been like earlier in the evening, right? Yeah, that was when that was just when Black Lives Matter first came down in front of us. You know, when they marched in front of us, we watched, we stood in front of the um, car source lot probably, excuse me, two to three hours before BLM, before the whole group marched down to us. They were up on, um, I don't know if it's 52nd, they were more north of us by the courthouse. They were down there, and you could see the Bearcats down the road, and they all had their headlights on, and you could see people running past them with the headlights. You could hear the, the cops yelling commands to them. Um, we had right next to the car lot that we were, we were sitting at. Kitty Corner from us was the lot where the 100 cars were burnt out. Um, and then on the left of me, because I was facing Sheridan, so on my left, that next block north, I don't know what building was there. It might have been a church. I don't know. It's all grass right now. Right, but it right. was a a, um, a a brick building that was nothing but rubble, and it was still smoldering. So all throughout the night, we would have young kids. These had to be 14 years old running up the side streets, grabbing bricks, or they would go and run into the car lot and try to start the car lot on fire. Um, or they're in the building next to the car lot. There's a bank and a hotel there, or some ballroom or something there. I'm not real familiar with everything there. And they're in there. They're trying to break windows to gain entry. 
So it was just all around you the whole night. Mm -hmm. Plus you got helicopters going by. Um, sometimes they're really loud, but more they were over the black life. So it was like two to three hours that we stood in front of that building where we didn't have the big crowd come down by us. We just had random opportunists that were running around us, grabbing bricks, trying to create more fires, um, trying to bust windows, see if there's a car they could get at, you know, just the, the petty shit. And I think they were all anywhere from 12 to 15, 16 year olds that were doing it, you know, the, the opportunists. It's like, hey, let's go and do this. It's funny, I say that because after we went to leave Car Source, after everything happened, we had to lock the place up ourselves because the guy with the keys was gone. Right. So when after we got locked up, and I'll explain all that later, but after we, we got the place locked up and we went to leave, here's another pair of 13-year-olds. And you knew how old they were by the giggling. They're over by the engine. They're whispering. They're over by the car. So right on the very end, and we're standing there, mm -hmm. and they're right on the very end, and they're giggling. He, 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 come on. Hurry up. Hurry up. Get a light. Hurry up. Come on. Get it lit. Get it lit. Oh, come on. Let me take this off. Come on. Get it lit. Get it lit. Get it lit. And we drove over. They're like, get the fuck out of here. Right. What are you doing? And they had to be like 13 years old. And that was at 3 in the morning. Right. So where are these parents that these young people, kids are out on a night when they know there's riots going on. I want to take a quick moment to address, I guess I'm echoing again. I don't know what you did last time to fix it. Well, it went away. Um, or then it came back, but that's fine. It's not that bad. So anyway, uh, Brant for Liberty, who's actually restreaming us, brought up that he feels that the reason why Yellow Pants and you know some of the other witnesses were not called to the stand was because it would have not actually had been any good. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it would have been bad for the defense. Right. You know, so shout out to Brand for Liberty. Thank you for restreaming today. And I figured I'd bring that point up. Um, and some people are asking me if Kenosha has recovered at all. I did cover that some with Kevin Matheson when I had him on my show. Have you been back to Kenosha since all of this? Well, just for the trial. And um, we went down, we were supposed to be down at a certain time. And, you know, you're not knowing what traffic's going to be like. We got down about an hour early. So, I had said to the person driving me, I said, let's drive down and see where we all stood. I want to see what it looked like. And that's when I saw that that building that was just all rubble. Um, it was just a nice grassy area. And then I saw the car source and I saw the car lot, you know, and everything looked kind of repaired. Um, but you could tell that, I, I, well, I guess that's a wrong term to say. I couldn't tell that there was riots going on just in the area that I was other than what I knew was there before. So I guess if I wouldn't have known that that happened, I guess I wouldn't have realized that a riot had happened or buildings were burnt down. So, but there are buildings missing from that beginning night. Right. And that's Kevin Matheson also kind of went a little bit, a little bit more depth about the, the social and the, uh, economic effects of the riots. And um, if anybody wants to check that out, I can provide you the link to the great conversation that I had. It was a it was a roundtable discussion with me and a few other great uh, streamers. You guys can check that conversation out. Um, you know, but in any case, um, now... Well, Kevin, Kevin lives down there too, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, he's more familiar with the city. And like I said, I've only been down there um, since the night we stood was for trial and we just drove past where we went. We went with st and sat by the lake until it was time to go into the courthouse. Sure. So now, um, I guess going back to that evening, I mean, you're telling us a lot of stuff that was not covered in any of the videos and that's great because it gives us some yeah. insight into the part about this that doesn't really get talked about because again, the, the, the media narrative is that it was a peaceful protest and these people no. were coming out with guns to, interfere with the first amendment rights of the peaceful black lives matter protesters and i was like no i'm sorry there's just way too much video that says otherwise and i do believe that there were peaceful protesters present but they were definitely yeah. not i didn't get the feeling that they were in charge you know that, that, that we, go ahead they weren't so you know other than there were the girls that were taunting me and 
you know, they seemed a bit mad, but you know, I guess if you're, even if you're peacefully protesting, you, you, you know, you're, you're showing your voice, you know, you're, you want people to hear you. So I understand that. Um, and there were others, the lady yelling, um, if somebody walked on the street, stay on your property, get off the street. She just seemed, I, I don't know if she was a leader in what, in the, this March, but I literally have have that woman's voice stuck in my head because I had to rewatch that over and over and over and over to get the mic, my points, particularly when Binger lied and claimed that Rosenbaum wasn't present at that moment. I had to listen to protect your property, not the streets, protect your property, not the streets. Let me say this like 50 times, you know, because as if it would be more valid then, you know, that's, you know, I, I would say that one of the big energies that I caught for me, I think the catalyst was the dumpster fire, at least from the footage that I had, was that these people resented that anybody was stopping them from burning the city down. Yeah, you know, getting to that, um, just let me finish about the night because I- Yeah, I'll, no, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Um, <clears throat> so after we got, um, you know, Rosenbaum screamed that stuff after um, Yellow Pants, and Yellow Pants even repeated what Rosenbaum said, and he said too, he was gonna cut our hearts out. He was gonna kill us. You know, we are all motherfuckers to him. I, I hope I can swear on this. Um, oh, you totally can. Okay. So, and then Rosenbaum, he had, had made his comments. And I, the, the biggest shock when I said that in court, I think the reason that I said that is it was such a shock to me to hear that that night, him use the N-word. And the girls that were standing in front of me, they even, you saw their jaws drop and their heads turn and they looked at him and they looked at each other and I'm, I'm eating this up going, what's going to happen with this? And then they just continued to, to taunt me. So I was shocked by that. So when they asked, well, what did you do? Well, I guess I didn't do anything because I was in fucking shock from hearing him say that, you know, but again, you don't agitate. Um, the best thing to do is just ignore people because when you ignore them, they get sick of you and ignore them and they move on to the next person. They look for those weak people. You know, that's what they look for. But anyway, so we had the um, chemical bomb hit us and then the Bearcats moved up and started pushing them out and they're they're yelling over their, their loudspeakers or whatever to keep moving. And then we got tear gassed by the police only because the police saw us draw our weapons on yellow pants. So I know during that incident, I don't know if it was when yellow pants was on the car. I thought it was when yellow pants was on the car. Kyle was actually treating a girl up against the building that had sprained her ankle. Right. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. So, and, and I think, and just as the cops were, were retreating, that's when all the podcasters and Facebook livers and live streamers or whatever you want to call them, is when they started coming up and that was kind of after the police pushed everybody away. That's when all the photos and videos and phones and cameras, that's when all those things came up. But we had asked the, I know Kyle, when the girl walked away, Kyle had asked the police, then do you have any water? Because our eyes are just all, all water and they're burning. You can't breathe. And they said, oh, all we can do is give you one. And then they said something about, um, we're not supposed to pull our guns out. Right. And, oh, and then they told us not to shine the laser on people. Well, that was a hand laser, but also the buildings behind us, they had lasers as well. So when they had showed in the video in court, it, I think that McGinnis had like a laser beam on his chest. Um, that wasn't coming from us. That was coming from the people on the, on the roofs and on their balconies. So you're saying there were other people that were up above that were not like that were not the people that were on the, the roof of the actual building set the car source. Oh yeah, there was people up on their roofs, there was people on the second store balconies, there were people sitting on their porches, there were people literally lining around the apartment building that was there across directly across from us was like a parking lot and on the other side of that was an apartment building. And during the night before BLMers came down in front of us, before that incident happened I just mentioned, they came up and said, hey, you know, it looks like you guys are protecting this business. 
um, we know, we'll keep our eyes open for you if you keep your, um, your eyes open for us. He said, last night, BLMs tried to start their apartment building on fire and they had families living in there. So I, I'm like, oh my God, with people living in there? And he's like, yeah. He goes, so tonight we're, we're weaponized and we're not going to let that happen. It's like, holy shit. Um, and so I found, found it kind of funny when Binger kept saying, so you're, you're just going to use a gun to protect property. And it's like, you don't understand a lot of these properties have families in them. Right. You, well, they only burn down empty businesses. You don't freaking know that. Right. You know, well, so and that was, yeah, I remember during the course of the Minnesota riots, there was somebody who got killed because they burned down a store and he was down in the basement and they didn't find his body until later. And yeah. it didn't get picked up by the media at all. And the only reason I knew about it was, I think it was Mercado Media. Mind you, I don't think that's what he was calling himself yet because he hadn't been a big streamer. But that was reported to him while they were there. And then they just never talked about it again. The 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 lives that were lost during the course of these riots are invisible. Yes, they are. They don't get no mention. Just like um, <laughs> I was listening to the trial um yeah, you know, I, I work like 10 and a half or it, it, I'm gone for like 10 and a half, 11 hours a day for work. And I come home and you go on, on YouTube or whatever. And it's like seven hours of the trial. Well, I can't watch, sit here and watch seven hours. I would like to watch everything, but I can't. So you kind of sure. zip through to see what you want. But, um, oh, I forgot where I was going. Oh, they were talking, Binger was talking about um, justice for, Huber and Rosenbaum and, and Grosskreutz. And I'm thinking to myself, why why isn't anybody fucking saying, what about justice for the 71-year-old man who got his ass beat for trying to protect someone's business yep. with a fire extinguisher? Yep. Where's his justice? Yep. That's what I railed Glowicki about because he was all upset about like all the things that he thought he saw. But like, it, in addition to the fact that they... The, the people that they're holding up, like, that's why I did a video specifically called Woke Rape Culture, which was a play on the concept that supposedly people just ignore rape. Woke rape culture is when somebody happens to be a rapist, but they suit your cause. And let's say you're a super progressive. So now you're going to walk around with a sign of Rosenbaum, you know, over your head, even though he's a rapist. And then you're, you know, you don't bring up the fact that Jacob Blake was a rapist. You don't talk about all the terrible things that yeah. these people have done. That's all invisible. You know, and we don't talk about the fact that Anthony Huber was a domestic violence offender, you know, but all of those things, like in any one of those things, like if somebody was, I don't know, somebody said something that one of these people didn't like on Twitter 15 years ago, they would want them unpersoned, fired from their jobs, you know, yeah. that, that they should not be allowed to speak anywhere, have any kind of a platform ever, 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 you know, how dare they. But it changes everything if they feel that, that that person's experience is somehow more valuable to, you know, to what they're trying to push, their political mm -hmm. views. And that's why they don't talk about the fact that Jacob Blake was a rapist violating the restraining order that his victim had against him. You know, well, you know, no, and, and when we bring it up, they say, well, his past doesn't matter. No, his fucking past does matter. Right. It well, all makes it, him who he is now. Right. And it's it, the thing that, you know, when it comes to the case, that was the thing that they freaked out about was that they weren't allowed to like it's it's interesting when you try to talk to them is like so they're upset at the judge because they didn't get to bring in a bunch of stuff like, you know, whether or not it was Kyle's getting into a fight with a girl that was beating up his sister who was like smaller than the girl in question, you mm -hmm. know, or the the video about like outside the CVS during the course of the shoplifting or they did, they want all of that stuff put in. But they obviously would never be okay with talking about Huber's history or Rosenbaum's history. That's why you don't allow it. It's called propensity evidence. This right. is just basic 101. You know, and it's funny is the brief moment during the trial when they started trying to portray Anthony Huber as a nice guy, then the defense was like, hold, hold on a second. Um, <laughs> if you guys want to open the door to that, then we're going to bring up all the things that he did. And then they, they listed off more details about Anthony yeah. Huber than I even knew. You know, right. And yeah, I did see that. And I was I was happy to hear that because I think there were so many opportunities missed during the trial for both um, the defense and probably the prosecution. I, when I was there, the questions he asked me and why he had me state how Kyle was holding his gun. 
I literally thought he was just grasping at straws. The guy had nothing, so he's just trying to make up time. You know, it's just weird. But I was happy to hear that the defense was bringing that stuff up. Right. You know, yeah, you know I, at the moment, when these guys, you know, when all this went down, nobody knew who anybody was. You know, we didn't know Rosenbaum was who he was or who Anthony Huber was or who Gage Grosskreutz was. I mean, for God's sake, Grosskreutz followed him with a uh, his phone asking him where he's going. He told him he's going to the police. So he's not, you know, he if he was an active shooter, he would have turned around and shot you then. Right. right. You know, so why would you then follow him and then pull your gun on him? Right. You know, he literally said he was going to the police. So right. it was... It was just really stupid. You well, just... that only gets more insidious because remember what he said is that he believed because apparently, and, and Balch had told people earlier that supposedly the cops had said that they were going to push the protesters at them. And yes. I believe that that's possible. But No, you know, they did say that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Were, were you present when cops said that or? Oh, yeah. They were going to push them to us. Oh, so you were there for that too. Okay. Oh, so where are we were standing? I'm sorry, what? No, go ahead and tell it. So where we were standing, um, so this was before they came down by us. Right. There was, there was actually two incidents. So before they came down by us, they actually had the road blocked. So right next to the building we were protecting, there was another little gas station. It was set back a little ways. And then here's the street, Sheridan. And then here's that um, ultimate gas station. Right. So the cops had their vehicles parked there and we went over and talked to them and we're like, well, you know, I guess it's, we kind of thought that it was never going to happen. And she's like, oh no, we're pushing them down this way. So she explained what they were doing is they try to weave them in and out of the streets and they try to, um, so, cause what happens is you can have the opportunists who run off then and try to start these other fires or do this other damage. And that's when the police can pick them up. And I'm like, well, that's actually a pretty good idea. Right. So they, they were doing what they were doing. So she explained that to us. And then later on, after um, they had pushed the crowd past us, you know, you could look down the street and see the Boost Mobile sign and the gas station. You could see all the damage going up. And the one cops had told everybody, because I was right there. I was with an earshot of the cops on the corner. And they said, right, oh, well, if nothing else, we're going to push this crowd back up by you guys. It's like, I thought, oh, sh okay, well, as long as, you know, the police are here, because now we had Ryan gone, Kyle was gone, Lurk was gone, and Dustin was gone. They were all gone, so it was me on the ground with three, four guys up on the roof. Right. You know, so they said they were going to push them back our way. So there was, like, two incidences where... They pushed the crowd down, the the Bearcats backed up, and the crowd came at us. We had to go in the building. I did anyways. The guys on the roof were still on the roof. And then the police came and pushed them back down in front of us and past us. And then we could come out of the building. And then it sounded like more shots were happening at the gas station. Um, so that's why the guys had left again. And then the Bearcats backed up, and here came everybody with rocks and uh, stones and, you know, sticks and whatever they could find, they were throwing at us. So we're in the building, but you're in the back, and it's all open and exposed. It's just fenced in. So if you're standing back there, and there was cars that were piled in there because they didn't want them to get burnt down, they were just pelting us. They were getting the guys on the roof. They were getting us that were in the back. We had to literally, we couldn't go in the building because of the tear gas and the chemical bombs. And they were still throwing them. So we couldn't even go in the building because you couldn't breathe in there. So you had to, the, the big garage door was open and you had your head out and we're trying to get fresh air and they're throwing these bricks. I had to put my helmet on so I could stick my head out to get fresh air. But when so that, so when we were up front before they did that, so I heard the cops say that, that they were going to push them back to us. So that's why the guys had come back. Right. And that was the first time. But then we watched when the cops pushed them back. You could watch and look down the street, and you could see the Boost Mobile signs move in. You saw the dumpster going down the road, you know, people pushing that. 
Uh, you could hear the screaming and the fighting and the chanting and the police yelling at them. And then the police, I think they're shooting rubber bullets and there's guys with garbage can covers dodging them. Um, and then we saw the, the dumpster start on fire and be pushed into the gas station. Now, the gentleman that stopped that dumpster, it was a kind of a bigger guy, bigger build. Had I think he had a, like a long white t-shirt on. The second time that the police, oh, I got to take a drink. <clears throat> the second time the police backed up and the crowd came at us, I just got in and I locked the door and I heard this banging on the door and I just screamed, well, who is it? And he's like, please, please let me in. They'll kill me. Well, you, you got no way to see. So I took the chance. I opened up the door and he just slid right in and I shut the door and I locked it. And here it was the gentleman, which I didn't know until I watched videos later. It was a gentleman that literally stopped Rosenbaum from pushing the dumpster into the gas station. And oh. that's when that's when Rosenbaum started yelling, shoot me, nigger, shoot me, nigger. Right. So that was that whole incident there. So he literally, I literally hid him in the back underneath the vehicles for a good two hours while we were being pelted and stoned and just attacked. He hid back there for quite a while. So there's like all kinds of other stories about this that we just haven't heard. And it's crazy that. Just, yeah, absolutely. That, that's absolutely. how nutty it went, you know, and I, I did want to point out real quick what I was bringing up. So like Gage Grosskurtz's impression, according to his, his trial testimony was that he thought he, he tried to say that he said that he was working with the police, which I'm not even inclined to believe, but no if he did believe that, then what that meant was that Gage thought he was taking it upon himself to do what this he thinks that this kid was working with police to kill protesters so he's yeah. at that point trying to prevent kyle from getting to the police you yeah know, oh, if that's yeah. his objective that changes the whole angle on the whole thing yeah, you know and that point. means he's taking it upon himself to do what you're going to apprehend a police like <laughs> you know informant or something like you know and then what are you going to do what's the right. next move you're going to take him hostage because you're certainly not going to give him to the cops at that point, right? Yeah. You know, like if you go along with Gage's version of like of what would have happened, you know, it it, it further complicates everything. It really makes you go like, what the hell? You know, like what? The, so what did you think was going to come out of this if he had gotten his way? You know, that's I, I don't. It's it's crazy. Like you know, and to, and to hear from you, you know, again, it just talks about just how absolutely nutsoid all of this stuff is. You know, as far as like what was going on in Kenosha at the time, and it brings me back to like, well, yeah, this is like, but even even before Kenosha, like when that poor guy, you know, got stomped out in Portland by Marquis Love, yeah. you know, soccer kicked in the head. That was fresh in my mind when Kenosha is going on. You and know? you know what? I think it was fresh in everybody's mind because I don't think that scene has left anybody's mind who saw it. Right. Now that one sticks. And and yes. the funny thing is, is that uh, the idiots at the intercept tried to say that he took that, like that Drew Hernandez, because he took that with a, with a hidden camera, that he took it out of context or something. And so Drew was like, well, fine, here, let me show you the rest, which is like 45 minutes of Black Lives Matter security, in quotes, walking around the streets of Portland, hunting white people to beat up. And, you know, they literally at one point said, we're here for Black Lives Matter. Fuck these white cunts. Like, yeah. that's what they were doing all night. It, you know, providing the context at that point didn't do a damn thing to make BLM look any better in that situation. And like you said, it's fresh in your mind. I know that that, that moment, as somebody who used to attend protests back in the day, I'm like, I'm never going to one of these things unarmed ever again. Yes. You know? and, and when you think about it, that's what they think they wanted Kyle to do, was just surrender to the mob. You know, you know, when they were talking about that, I thought to myself, because, you know, like I said earlier, um, people like this or mobs or non-peaceful protesters, opportunists, they look for the weak. So I was taunted, I was singled out, and Kyle was taunted and he was singled out. So what if I would have been in Kyle's shoes and Rosenbaum chasing me? 
what would have happened then? What would have, what would it have been if he was chasing a white woman? Would right. I have been? Oh, he's chasing down a, a racist. She's white. Right. If I shot him with my with my handgun, what would have happened then? Would I have had to sit in jail that long? Would have I had to go through that trial? What if it would have been me that had to shoot him? Yeah, you know, I I don't get how these officials um, don't see that these opportunists, these criminals, they literally pick on the weak. That's what domestic violence is. They pick on someone weaker than them. They weaken them and they pick on them. You know, right. bullies. So I, I, I thought about that. It, it hit me when the trial was happening and they were talking about that, you know, about why don't you just put your gun down? And I'm thinking, no, they went after him because he's the weak one. If he would have put his gun down, they would have beat the shit out of him. They would have killed him. They could right. have shot him, stabbed him, done anything. They would have killed him. And then That's... I thought, Jesus, what if that would have been me? Would the, would the outcome have been the same as far as the trial, the media, the names, the lies. Right. And that's exactly what Drew Hernandez said when he was being interviewed at, by Tim Poole. He sincerely felt as somebody who was standing right there that that crowd probably would have killed him. You know? Yeah. And, and then that's why I just, it, it's also like, it just keeps coming back to the relevant point being about what the hell were they so mad about? And it really came down to, again, these people are here interfering with our monopoly on force. We want to be able to destroy any property we take a mind to destroying. And you're interfering with our ability to do that. You know, and th that that really is what made them all upset. The guns made them upset. And, uh, and even in that first confrontation, I say this all the time, the dumpster fire confrontation, they were so emboldened that they're getting up in the faces of guys with guns. What do you think would have happened to the Kenosha Guard if they were standing there unarmed after they put out that fire? Yes. Yes. Yeah. If you want to ask why we need guns, you know, it just that's the other thing is, is that the, the, the issue that keeps coming up is, you know, that people are more important than property and property can be replaced. I'm like, OK, are you going to replace the property? Because you're not. Yeah. It, it's all well and good to claim that that's what you're going to do. It's also good to try to attempt to claim that somehow people don't have a, a livelihood connection to their property. I was yeah. just going to say that. I'm going to say, don't people give a part of their life to um, make themselves better? Don't they give their life to create a business and, and keep it running? They're giving their life to do this. So, yeah, sometimes property is worth another life. You've already given your life to it. Why does somebody get the, get the opportunity to take it away? I, I don't believe anybody should, should be shot, so please don't take that out of context. But it's just ridiculous because these people give their lives for their property. Right. And, and it hurts them directly. You know, that's why, like, it, it, it's always interesting to speak, I guess you could say, from the privilege of being the person whose property and livelihood is not being destroyed. Yeah. You know, that it's easy to say then that it's fine, you know. And or even to assume that the insurance will do something about it, because in many yeah. cases it wouldn't, you know, yeah. and nothing's going to bring back, you know, the experiences of the people in question, you know, as far as once again, talking about the gentleman who got his jaw broke, you know, it, that's going to be a scar in his life forever, you know. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. It, but it again, those people seem to be invisible. That guy's invisible, you know, um, just like any other violence that was, you know, met out during the course of all of these riots in 2020. You know, and that's why I did a documentary comparing them to January 6th, which, mind you, I don't support January 6th either, but there's an obsession with it. And they act like it was the only riot that even took place in like the last three years or something. When no even, even if you follow the the statistics, they'll, they'll hit you with the statistic that says, like, I think like 96 percent of all Black Lives Matter protests were peaceful. And I'm like, well, that's interesting because there's another statistic that says that 95% of the riots involve Black Lives Matter. Like yes. there's actual hard statistics. It's in one of the little photos that's in my intro, which like shows all the hot spots. There were almost 600 riots in one year alone and almost all of them involved Black Lives Matter. So yeah. at that point, yes, it's, it's true that there were a lot of peaceful protests, but again, they don't do anything to stop this. And instead you've got clowns like the BLM leader from New York City 
saying no, if you don't God. give us what we want, there will be riots, there will be fires, and there will be bloodshed. Yep. But somehow that's not domestic terrorism? Right. What and definition that, I don't are they understand using? understand that. Right. So I guess now um, we talked a lot about what happened that night, and, and obviously they have your version of it from the from the trial. What, what are your impressions from the trial? Like having been part of that experience, you know, were there any memories specifically that you would share? Like anything that sticks out in your mind about like what it was like to participate in that? Well, it was weird. The, the night I went down there, I was eerily calm. I don't know if it's because I was in shock from what I was seeing, but I mean, I was calm. I was quiet the whole night. You know, I just, I'm more of the observer kind of person to begin with anyways. I, I like to take things in and, and observe. Um, but it was just, as soon as I walked into the courtroom, I was, it's like I went into slow motion. I didn't even right. realize where the, where the jurors were until I had to turn around and look at the map. And it's like, oh my God, she's like three feet from me. I didn't even realize that the jury was sitting right to my left. So right. it. It's kind of funny. I don't know if I had the tunnel vision. I, I don't even know that I even looked at the defense other than when they were standing up talking to me. And I, I guess there's nothing. I think the most shocking was was me repeating what Rosenbaum said. Right. I know people have commented it. I've seen someone say that that N-word rolled off her tongue real easy. Um well, I hear I hear that rolled off a lot of uh, white and black tongue, tongues very easily. Right. You guys claim to be for black lives. Um, I think it was. I think the jury and needed to be as shocked as I was that night when I heard it, and uh, otherwise I wouldn't have repeated it. I don't think it would have been as shocking if I would have said, "M F and N's." Right. Yeah. I think and, that was well, and and in more to the point, when it comes to that, I mean, like in addition to that, there was ways that, um, uh, for example, like the first day of the trial, they put up that Richards used the N word three times, but the the headline was like, you know, the defense begins their you know statements by using the N word three times, like you know, as if that was like to try to imply that Richards himself must therefore be racist. Right. You know, like any, in, in there, you know, I agree with you about the selective, you know, issue about enforcement when it comes to, um, you know, like who can and cannot say this word. And honestly, if I could go my whole life without ever hearing it again, I, I think that would be fantastic. And I would say that oh, yeah. some of the older black people will agree with that statement, but now yes. they're trying to make it cool. You know, yep. like, and I, I look at my kids, I'm like, you're never saying this ever. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, we say it if it's relevant to something like we're repeating what was said because it's necessary for conversation, you know, but that's, you know, again, not the same thing, not even close. And, you know, I think that we, we're just in a situation now where the, the racial divide grift is its own thing. Like there seems to be a need like, you know, you look at a person like Joy Reid, who makes her whole life on MSNBC uh, out yeah. of pushing this issue. And that's when you start to realize that there's a monetary incentive to keep all of this going. Like, oh, yes, you know, if, if we didn't, you know, especially now, because like I watch Breaking Points with Crystal and Sager and they pointed out that media ratings plummeted when Trump was out of office because the, le the left media didn't have anything to bitch about anymore. You know, <laughs> so they needed something else. Yeah. You know, so they jump on the written written house thing. They jump on the racial grift thing. You know, they they need to have something to complain about to get people riled up about, and that's just what they picked. And unfortunately, that means that these people have a vested interest in stoking the fires. Yep. So that they have stuff to report on. It yep. makes a monetary interest in in creating chaos. You know. And, and that's sickening, honestly. It's it is. Sickening. It yeah. is. It, it's pathetic that they actually are spreading the racial divide. They're spreading the hate, um, the lies. They're destroying people's lives with their lies. You know, right. and, uh, yeah, and for what gain? Their monetary gain. You know, it's it's sad. I You know what really shocks me is since this, uh, these protests started 
um, and the COVID lockdowns, I'm shocked that I didn't see more journalists quitting, leaving, going to in, more independent shows not sparking up. I'm just shocked because there's some um, uh, newscasters that I've, I've met like out on motorcycle runs and stuff. Right. Or you just happen into when you're at some, not a concert, but like down at the domes. Right. And you talk to them and they're nothing like how they are now. Right. It's, it just seems like they, it's, they're being forced to do this. So I'm just, I, I don't understand it. I, my head just spins when you listen to the local media. I, I'm just, I'm shocked about it. Is there anything that like, I mean, that you run into now? Like, I guess it, it has to be frustrating for you in particular because you were present for all of these activities. Just to listen to the stuff that they're still spinning that was disproven months ago. That has yeah. to be maddening to be looking at TV, like with people in suits that are supposed to be telling the truth for a living. Like that's their yep. job, you know, and the stuff that they spin is so out of control, you know, and I, I guess we kind of get to a point like, what is the breaking point? Like, when do we just like, you know, there, there was a series of things that happened that I think created the perfect storm that we're in, that we are in. The first was the elimination of the fairness doctrine which was now they don't have to tell both sides of a story. Right. Then, then there was uh, the elimination of, there used to be a regulation of how much of the media one person was allowed to own. They got rid of that. So that makes somebody like say Rupert Murdoch very powerful because he owned yep. a lot of the media, you know? And then, um, then there was a lawsuit where Fox, I believe was sued. And the end result of the lawsuit was that the ruling stated that they are not actually obligated to tell the truth. So, like, you put these three things together and you have this absurd media circus that we have now, you know, and I usually, because, like, my kids are involved in the legitimate collegiate sport of wrestling, I would compare the news that we have now to, like, the WWE. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, it's yeah, all I, formulated. Did you have any comments on that? Uh, no, I, I agree with you completely. I uh, I think about when I was, a uh, you know, younger and in my fifties, but like in my twenties, it's like the media and the newscasters and stuff, even officials were supposed to be respected. I mean, we were raised that way. There's things that happen that I could still hear the belt sliding out of my dad's belt loops. <laughs> right. You know, it's just, there's no respect. I mean, the, as the mouth on some of this younger generation Holy crap! We we would have been our asses would have been bleeding from that belt whooping we got. We would have never said that. I'm just I'm just shocked. It's just the, it, it's a whole weird freaking world, and I just well, miss the older days. You well, know, even if like even if it wasn't like regular, like my mom didn't use corporal punishment very often, but she still had that like you know there if it was necessary. I think that part of the problem is is that. Every generation gets told, you know, with an eye roll, well, every generation doesn't like the generation after them. I'm like, yeah. okay, but I'm actually kind of young minded. A lot of my friends are younger than me. And no, I got to say that there's something different this time around. And I think that a lot of it actually comes back to what I would call, first of all, the social sciences themselves, which would therefore include child psychology, are yep. engaged in really bad research. Wow. So like, for example, the research about spanking. Now, um, one of the major studies that would get quoted about that, they took data from kids who were just paddled sometimes and clumped it together with kids who were beaten bloody and then <laughs> said, see, you know, like, because they look, you know, like, you know, we, that, you know, because they put those data sets together. That means kids who are paddled get the same results as kids who are beaten bloody. You could never get away with that in any other science, you know, because what the end result was to say, you see all spanking results in more depression, more anxiety, more and more, more, you know, like, and then you like, let's say we were doing engineering and we're doing a study about the strength of metal. And I mm -hmm. took the results from tin and stuck it into the same data set with titanium. Yeah. Like you'd get laughed out of, you know, you, you, there's no way you could ever get away with that in engineering. Right. Right. But in social sciences, 
and it's becoming worse by the day, you know, a lot of the papers that I read from social sciences now don't even have any data in them. No, you know, it's like just somebody talking, you know, like that's like when they put out that paper that said that whiteness is a parasitic condition. Like I read that on my show and I was like, there's no data in here. There's no science in here. This is a guy talking in fancy terms and he doesn't even bring up like, you know, any like he didn't do any tests. He just came to a conclusion that like being white is a mental condition. He thinks he can cure. You yeah. Know? And, and it's so, all this, all these new terms. I want to know what data they're using to come to these conclusions, but they never, they never show it. They never have it. They never expose it. Right. And the new one I just heard uh, on my way home from work yesterday was um, farming, farmers markets, um, uh, charitable uh, food banks and food charity and home gardening is all born of white racism. <laughs> We're supposed to get rid of this. Like, what the hell is going on? Right. Yeah, I just read one not long ago that um, white people owning dogs is racism because uh, you know because supposedly that the the act of you know domesticating dogs only happened in Africa and therefore if we if we own dogs as white people then we're racist. It, yeah. No, and they they redefine terms in kind of a 1984 ish, you know, like way meaning reference to the the book written by um, Orwell, and. You know, and they do it in such a way to try to change people's thinking. And that's why we end up with these weird scenarios like, you know, somebody is racist because, you know, they didn't like a certain movie that's important to people of a certain race. Like if you didn't yeah. care for Black Panther, it must mean you're racist. You know, just really trivial stuff. Yeah. You know, and but it, it but as, as far as back to what was going on with the kids is that if that because what's going on, I see in the in the discipline is that. There are lots of articles you can read shaming parents out of spanking. There are very few that have anything I would call realistic alternatives. Like, and that's how, because like one of the places I used to work had a lot of kids at it because we had a playland. And this, the, the behavior I would see was just absolutely atrocious. And, it, it, and you see these parents struggling, like, what am I going to do? Like, it, you, they just... And then every week, it seems like they take another tool off the table because then you're going to read an article, and I've read these, like, no more yelling. We're not yeah. allowed to yell at them anymore. No timeouts. You know, it, it reminds me of, like, and it's, mind you, it's just a joke, but it's like that scene in the movie Aliens where they go, what are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language? You know, but <laughs> as they take the guns away from the Marines, you know, when they're getting ready to go into the hive where all the bad aliens are. But yeah, the point yeah. Is, is, you know, although you can't use harsh language either because no yelling, you yeah. know. So what is the end result of this is, well, the end result of this is that there are kids coming out of the other side of this system that are, it's getting even worse because then they're raising their own kids. And, and I'm yeah. open to alternative discipline, but what ends up happening is none, you know, and, and you talk to these people and what you get out of it is like, well, my kids are perfectly behaved and I never spanked them or even yelled at them or gave them timeouts. And I'm like, I don't believe you, but even if that were true for your kids, Every kid's personality is different. Yes. You know, like my daughter, my son, my, my son required a considerably more discipline than my daughter. That's just the truth. That's just their personalities. Right. You know, you know, and but anyway, coming back to like what we were talking about, I do agree that I think that a lot of that has to do with the mentality that we're dealing with right here. You know, um, as far as like what goes into these kids when I deal with them, when you're trying to communicate with them about why they're rioting, why they hold the views that they do. You know, and they're being conditioned to be very emotional and not rational, mm -hmm. you know, and like I, I brought this up many times in my podcast before, but like at one point, you know, like I've heard them literally say that logic and reason are whiteness, you know, yeah. and that those things should be cast out. We shouldn't be basing things on that, you know, and then these this goes along with like the lived experience of people of color is being treated as if that is admint. But if you have a negative experience as a white person, then you're then it's anecdotal. Your, yeah. your lived experiences are anecdotal. The lived experiences of the group that we're trying to push, well, that's different. You know, that whatever they say, you absolutely must believe all the time. And the only thing that I've seen out of all of this nonsense, in addition to trying to tell people of color that they can't be racist, is it's just encouraging the behavior. Like, you know, when I did my video the, the um, about specifically because they were trying to blame 
all these attacks on elderly Asian people. They were trying to blame them all on white people. I went and did the studies once again, like pulled up the science and grabbed the statistics. And the truth is that's not what's going on. Right. There's, you know, there are reasons in those communities that there's rough relationships between blacks and Asians. And it just so happens that according to the statistics, the majority of the hate crimes go taking place do happen to be, you know, from black people who live in those neighborhoods, Yeah. you know, and they, but that you can't talk about that out loud. And the, the experts will say things like, well, no, it's, it's actually white supremacy is what's causing yeah. that white supremacy. And I did a whole, it, my video is called, um, and you, and for those of you guys who are listening, if you want to check it out, it was pretty good. It was, um, uh, black racism against Asians, the truth in all capital letters, you know, and I play a video of, uh, they're like the, the show's called the red table and it's got Jada Pickett Smith is like Will Smith's wife. Oh yeah. I've seen, yeah, I, I haven't seen, I've heard of it. Right. Well, she's running a panel, you know, and, you know, to discuss this issue and they have a lady come on and explain why she doesn't like Asian people and all the stuff that she complains about is all like, well, you know, they come to our towns and they take our jobs and they open businesses. And I'm like, oh, you sound an awful lot like a Ku Klux Klan member talking about, you know, <laughs> immigrants. It's just, that's interesting, you know, but, the, you know, but the, you can't make that comparison. And then, of course, Dyson, who's like another professional grifter has to try to bring he tries to bring the conversation back around to white supremacy if that's what the yeah. problem is that's why these things are taking place it's it's all whiteness you know they, the people who aren't even everything. in those they people. always they always bring it back around to white supremacy what what i noticed years ago is the i think the internet is what really started a lot of this because you look at these younger kids the majority of them not all of them right um and a lot of these younger kids they don't even have social skills i mean they just they're socially awkward and uncomfortable right I mean, they're not all awkward that's a kind of a rough term to use but they're just they seem socially uncomfortable it's easier to sit on your keyboard and talk to someone or ridicule someone but I actually have that conversation face to face where you have differing opinions and they can't do it. Right. It erupts in violence, anger, shouting. I, I see it all the time. Right. It's, there's no rational conversations because now they have to do it face to face. And that's just a higher emotion they have to deal with now. So the friction is there and they're not going to listen to it. You're an asshole because you're wrong. You know, right. so I, I blame a lot of that on um, the internet. I, mean, I think it started a lot of it, and and you know, and you know, with the disciplining the children, and I see a lot of the younger generation that grew up with this internet, and they're so tied to their phones that they give their kid a laptop or a tablet to play with, so they can have peaceful ten minutes on their phone. So I, I think it's a lack of attention for the children. It's feeding them to the internet. They don't have the social skills. So I think a lot of that has played into where we are nowadays. And they don't have they the don't debate, have debate skills, skills either. either. No, not at all. Like they I, don't have, do they even have debate class in, in school anymore? We had it in ours. Well, yeah, well, if yeah, somebody's yeah, saying something that you don't like, don't like, then the solution is to get them censored as fast yes. as possible. Yes. You know, like I was in a secret... Uh, Antifa group once and they brought up abolishing the police. I just asked a couple questions and they demanded that I be banned immediately because they can't have anybody can't, you know, like counteract the narrative. It's just like blasphemy, you know, in, in a, like in an extreme cult or something like that. It's the same yeah. energy, you know, they, they can't handle it. And the re the consequence of that is that they push a lot of ideas and they push a lot of concepts that they're not really well thought out. And their answer is going to be at the end of the day, which is what it usually is. If Antifa doesn't like something you're saying, then they have this ideology that claims that it's self-defense for them to start beating you up yeah. because they don't like something you're saying, you know, and it's not just that that's immoral. It's not effective. It, it doesn't change anybody's minds. You might be able to get them to be quietly compliant, but that's going to be utterly reliant on your ability to hurt them when they can't hurt you. And that right. kind of brings us back to the Kyle Rittenhouse thing is like right after that verdict, a whole bunch of Antifa accounts on Twitter started panicking because of what that verdict meant to them 
was, geez, wait a minute. You mean people might be able to shoot us if we gang up and attack them at protests now? Yeah. Man, that's going to wreck our whole style of doing things. What yeah. are we going to do now? You know, like, and it, it's basically, you know, I, I'm looking forward to seeing where things are going, but it's going to take us, it's going to take work. Like, and I hope that there's going to be people like, you know, like you and I's perspective, for example, being, you know, having been around longer, you know, like we remember pre-internet, yep. you know, we remember pre-cell phone, you know, <laughs> we remember, you know, like, uh, like just different ways of disseminating information. And like you said, no social skills. I point out no argument skills. If somebody yep. doesn't agree with me, then I just take a personal offense to it. And then I just try to get them to shut up. What kind of society comes out the other end of that? Because it's not a strong yeah. one. And, and it's not, well, today's world is living proof of what kind of society comes out of it. It's division. Right. And, you know, I, I blame our government, too. The one thing I wanted to get across is I think our government's been shitting on the poor people for a long time. Right. You know, blacks, whites, Asians, all immigrants, all of them. Right. It, it's like they, they've always fooled this lower... A poor class of society. They've always fooled them into voting for them. It's going to be better. We're going to take care of you. We're going to do this for you. They don't do shit for you. Right. You know, and I think the government's been stomping on these people and even, even the aldermen. I hear the aldermen constantly, my people can't do this. My people can't do that. You know, my people are oppressed. Stop telling your people they can't do things. They're fucking Americans, not Americans. Right. You well, know, no. start, yeah, start I agree. New people up. I agree. And that's anybody who actually does activism in those communities understands that. Like I brought in a guy named Pastor Corey Brooks and his organization, you know, exists in Chicago in the most dangerous crime ridden neighborhood there is. And what they do is they go out and they get kids into apprenticeships so that they can have a trade. They keep kids in school. If yeah. a kid gets out of jail, then they try to keep him back out of jail and they try to get mm. his life in line. Is and his black organization Lives Matter listening? Say that again. <laughs> I said, is Black Lives Matter listening? I was trying to right. do a Joe Biden. No, black I wish. Black Lives Matter. Are you listening? Help right. your community. Right. And that's and what happens instead is that Corey's organization struggles for funding and Black Lives Matter is sitting on like 90 million and the yeah. three founders are all multi-millionaires, you know, and everybody involved in this racial grift. I did a whole stream just about the Black Lives Matter cash enterprise using a bunch of um, dollar signs in places of the S's, you know, and I exposed that like these people are all like have a ridiculously high net worth. Like the same thing with uh, the people who are sitting around that table at the red table conversation I'm talking about, like Dyson is like a, like has a net worth of like 7 million or something like that. You know, yeah. so we're supposed to believe these people understand the struggle. Like, no, you don't. Like, yeah, you know, yet. or like Jada Pinkett Smith is wealthy yeah. because of her husband. And then her daughter is on the show. Like her daughter's never wanted for anything in her life. Nope. Nope. You know, and I agree with what you're saying. And I think it's important that the right starts to understand that, too. And that's one of the things that I think is starting to happen was that during the course of all of this, when it comes to the, def the division between the left and the right is that. I think the right is starting to grasp that the super wealthy, and by that I mean like obscenely wealthy to the point that there's a pandemic going on, but I can play around with rockets because I'm Elon Musk or, you right. know, or, you know, like if you have that much money, those people are not your friends and they're not your friends if you're Republican mm -hmm. and they're not your friends if you're Democrats. As far as like regular people, Republicans, Democrats, I'm not talking about senators or congressmen, right. you know, and it's important that we come together and understand, you know, that there is another class of people that wants us fighting each other. That That's what this is about. And they do that so that they can continue. You know, this is the analogy I usually give. And it starts with a uh, there was there was a meme I came across that said Fox News is wealthy people paying other wealthy people to convince middle class people to blame poor people. Yeah, and I would say that's correct about Fox. But MSNBC is wealthy people paying wealthy people to convince poor people to blame middle class people. Yeah. You know, there's there's energy being put in both directions, you know, and then they keep us tied up with things that don't really change very often like, you know, all these different red herrings that get brought up during the debates, 
between presidential candidates that are stuff that's just not important. You know, we don't really need to know their religious beliefs. We don't need to know, like, you know, whether or not they got into an affair. I don't care about that. What the hell does that have to do with their presidency? You know, just stuff that's not important, you know. And that's why one of the aspects of my work, and it's one of the reasons that I don't really get into left versus right politics very much on my program, is because we have a bigger problem. We can't even talk to each other. Right. You know, and we can't speak with any level of honesty, you know, and that is way, way, way more dangerous than arguments about, well, we can talk about Medicare for all or gun rights or whatever, which, mind you, I think gun rights is important. And I also have my feelings about health care. The point is, is that if we can't have reasonable, honest conversations about basic things like Kyle Rittenhouse didn't cross state lines with a gun. Mm-hmm. Like if we can't even keep that in 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 check, then how the hell do we ever expect to have reasonable conversations about policies? You can't. I, people can't have their intellect hurt. Right. And it, it's sad because, like, like you said, it goes back to debating. They can't debate. They can't have their intellect even challenged, let alone hurt. Right. You know these these feelings is just. My God, people are just so soft these days. It's just sad. Wouldn't it be great if we had feelings about facts? Yeah. It would <laughs> like be we learned funny. something and then we determined how we felt about it based on the truth of what was actually going on and what wasn't. Yeah. You know, you know that that's where I want to get us to. And that's, you know, like I, for example, would like to see, you know, more democracy in the system, but it can't work if we're all idiots. You know, right. if, we, if we can't get a good handle on the truth, you know, so, for example, you shared a bunch of information tonight about things that were going on in Kenosha that even people who were in my clique of people who obsessively studied Kenosha, like, were like, oh, wow, like, you know, like, I didn't think about that or I hadn't heard about that or, you know, like, you know. Or you were, hey, yeah, I remember that. I mean, right. there's a, there's so many videos out there. And I, um, I remember Binger asking me, too, about videos I gave um uh, that i didn't give to the fbi was kind of funny i think the fbi was here before kyle even had a defense team right and i thought of that after the trial you know there's a few things that you remember after the trial it's like i said the i think the nerves hit me um as soon as i sat down and because i couldn't remember what the what date it was that i was down there and i i mean i know it was the 25th i know that but i didn't when they asked me um but it's just there's so much that you couldn't even tell because they ask you specific questions. But that whole night, I mean, the surroundings, even when um, the people, the protesters and all that weren't in front of us, there is helicopters overhead and uh, they got the drones going and they're, they got the big flashlights or not the flash, but the spotlights going from off the helicopters. It was a constant noise and something always happening. And then you got the little opportunists, the young ones that are running in between all night long. So when Binger says, well, once the police push them past you, that was it, right? <laughs> Hell no. Like, why didn't uh, you go home? The protesters weren't near your business anymore. I'm like, as if there wasn't, like, as if they, they couldn't come back. Yeah. You know, like, they there, did there's nothing twice. to stop them from coming back. Yeah, after the first time they came back twice. The last time was just pelting with rocks for a good half an hour, 45 minutes. Peacefully, mostly peacefully pelting with rocks. Oh, yeah, mostly peacefully. Fiery, but mostly peacefully. Well, not fiery that evening because you guys put out the fires, and that was what they were so irritated about. Yeah, yeah, and if if the, we call him the fuck around and find out guy, Yeah. if he would not have put that dumpster out, they probably would have got that fire rolling and rolled it right into us or right into the business we were protecting. Yep. There was no sensibility going on at all. That's for sure. So this has been a fantastic conversation and I hope that you and I can keep in touch, you know, because, you know, my fans definitely liked hearing from you and I do plan on doing some like panels in the future where we're going to discuss, you know, just world events, you know, it doesn't have to just be about, you know, about this. Um, you know, but I like talking to you and I think that it's good to have people from our generation also trying to communicate to the younger generation about, you know, um, things that are going on in the world, you know, and speaking of like police stuff, for example, um, 
you know, I think it's important for the right to remember that it's not like, especially when we bring up the FBI, like the FBI was doing some shady stuff in Kenosha, but yeah. it's not like the FBI is perfect. You know, look at Waco, look at Ruby yeah. Ridge, you know, like those are horrible situations, you know, and I try to remind conservatives of that. It's like, it's not as if the police are always fantastic to us. We still need to have law and order. You know, we still need to not be burning our freaking cities down. You know, we, that's all just ridiculous and it doesn't help anything, you know, and I do back the blue when they're good people, you know, mm -hmm. like I have a great friend who's, um, you know, a friend of the show. Uh, his show is called the strategic eye show and he's a black cop and his shows are fantastic. And he gives so mm -hmm. much insight into like the human side of being a police officer, you know? So, um, I want to thank you again for, for coming on. And I guess, you know, looking forward now, you know, I wanted to say like, how has this trial impacted your day-to-day -day life? Well, yeah, it's hard. I'm not used to any of the recognition, um, the memes. You know, I go to the store now and I'm, uh, I'm getting looks. And, you know, I'm not a paranoid person, but I know when somebody's staring at me, I did have one gentleman just come up and thank me. Um, so that was kind of nice, but then he went by and kind of real giddily said, I can't believe I just met you here. And I'm, I literally had to tell him, keep that under your hat because there's people that don't like that. And that's, I think that's what bothers me is people that are upset with me or want to, I don't know if they want to harm me, but there's people that are upset with me and don't like me or ridicule me or call me a racist. CNN said I, I was a, a hate spewing racist. Uh, so, you know, I don't like that because I think everybody should, we're humans. We should be treat, treat, uh, cr treated equally. So I, I don't appreciate it. Um, I would rather just stay away from the spotlight, but I think I kind of need to talk to someone too about it. It's, it's good to be able to say stuff like this. Well, I hope, well, that, I this hope that this conversation helped you. And it did. It did. And I would, say, I would that, say that echoing, echoing again. again. Um, Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, I would say that in addition to helping you, it also helps other people get to know that you're a person. I think it's easy for people to forget that the people in memes are still real people. You yeah, know? right. And, you know, and it, it's the same thing with the people who just took huge liberties with Kyle's reputation. And, and I hope that there's a reckoning on that for sure. You know, yeah. um, we'll, yeah. we'll look forward to the future to see for sure. You know, but, you know, and, and whatever you do, you know, hey, man, you got my number. If you need to chat, just let me know, you okay. know, and if you ever want to come on again, that'd be fantastic. And if you ever decide to get involved in anything, I mean, maybe this could be a situation where, hey, why don't you run for office? <laughs> well, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't ever convince anybody who would be good at it to do it. I try to tell strategic guys all the time he needs to run for sheriff or something because he'd yeah, be fantastic, you, you know, um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up and I'll be able to talk to you briefly off the air. I'll tell you when we're off. Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I want to thank everybody for who, you know, who restream restreamed me. I was restreamed by human dilemma today and brand for Liberty on Twitch. Um, you know, thank you to all of my Twitch followers. Thank you to those guys, you know, shout out to those channels. You should check them out on Twitch. If you have not already, um, you know, they do great stuff on their end as well. And coming up soon, my next interview is with Spike Cohen, the uh, Libertarian vice presidential candidate. We're going to discuss what it was like to be a third party candidate in the previous election. Um, you know, in addition to just the current state of things, Spike is an anarcho uh, capitalist, I guess would be the way to put it. But we had a fantastic conversation when I had him on my show and we became friends, even though we don't agree on everything. And remember, that's what we try to do here in V Radio is to try to have conversations with people that maybe we don't agree with all the time. If you haven't already, please consider like, subscribe, ring the bell, you know, and you can follow me here on YouTube or you can follow me on Twitch or you can follow me on Rumble or you can follow me on BitChute. I also do podcast versions of all these whenever I can. This one will probably be a podcast, for example. And you can check out my podcast in a lot of different mediums, um, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. You can find all of this on my website, v-radio.us. Um, and that's also linked in the description or the link tree website is linked in the description and there you will find the links to all this. 
if you want to donate to this effort, if you like this kind of journalism, I mean, like you take it like this. She didn't even want to come on a mainstream media show and I can't blame her, you know. And, you know, I would say, did you, do you feel this was a better experience than you probably would have had on CNN? Yeah, actually, they even emailed me to go on their New Day show. Yeah, I would never trust them. Hell <laughs> to the no. Yeah, right. <laughs> like if MSNBC wanted to talk to you, that'd just be insane. Like, you yeah, know, no. and CNN's really no better, you know, but, you know. It's funny because um, I didn't even respond to them. Right. But then I know at the last minute, um, somebody said, oh, yeah, they, they had Gage Grosskreutz on instead. It's like, shit. I wonder if I could have been on with them because I would have loved to have had a little debate with uh, Gage on there. That would have been interesting, but. Well, that would have been fantastic. Now, I do know friends of the show, Johnny Walker Dread and um, Logical Checkmate are supposed to be going live like right around the time that I'm done. So you guys, if you haven't already, you should check out their channel. Um, you get to see a Czech Republic perspective on our politics. And um, Johnny Walker Dread has done a lot of fantastic stuff about Kyle Rittenhouse and self-defense. I believe they're going to be talking about a, an up and coming self-defense case here pretty soon. I do plan on covering... Um, the uh, trial for the police officer who pulled her gun instead of her taser. Yeah. I'm just waiting for it to get out of the, uh, I I'm not as interested in the jury selection. Right. Cause you're, you're going to end up listening to a bunch of people that are not even going to be involved in the trial. Yep. So, but I do plan on covering that and it'll probably be in the same format it was before, which is me sitting around for eight hours a day to entertain all of you. So speaking of that, you know, again, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, subscribe star or PayPal, all of those can be found at v-radio.us or in the links up to my Linktree website, which is in the description of many of my shows. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you for listening to V Radio. Thanks, everyone.